looking at the 28% um, the model there, so the e-music type model, um, what was also interesting was that that model was particularly um, popular with 14 to 18 year olds who ranked it 37% versus the overall 28% in the study. Um, hardcore music fans, or crucial music fans as we call them in the study, also scored very, very highly, 42%. Um, heavy spenders on music in the market, which is slightly different from the music fan side, again, 39% versus 28%. And the most interesting one was people are already subscribing to music services, 58%. So, very, very interesting, that type of model. And this, again, is something that comes through very consistently on Facebook groups, that the degree of ownership um, it's very important to consumers at the moment. We can't say it's going to be there forever, but it's going to take quite a while to break that relationship that consumers have with owning a collection and feeling able to do what they want with it. <coughs> um, and these are just some quotes there that support really what consumers think about some of the subscription models that are out there, particularly the Napster model at the moment. You know, if I'm giving them £10 and then stop, it's £120 in a year. I've got nothing to show for it, that's ridiculous. Um, the bottom right quote there, um, I'll just read out the second one. With Napster, you can't possibly get into 10,000 records in one go, can you? It's not possible. That's what's unappealing about it. Um, I'm going to touch on that again a little bit in the Bible plan, but that's also very important. Marketing messages that talk to consumers about millions and millions of tracks don't really excite them. As an industry, you know, most of us will be very into music. We will be hardcore music fans. We'll have thousands of CDs, potentially. For most music consumers out there, that isn't the case. What they manage is a much smaller collection of music, and what they want is help navigating that small section that they're interested in. So it's okay talking about long tail, but we need to help consumers through that. And that's why I think some of the subscription models have failed to do so far. So, final section, really, just looking ahead. Uh, and some of this is drawn from Speakerbox, some of this is drawn from broader research that we've done, and uh, there's also a strong element of music allies industry knowledge um, that, that goes into these five point plans, um, or this five point plan. Um, what we're talking about really is bundling music, experimenting with schedules and formats, embracing the concept of free, not fearing it, um, changing the way the charts are constructed and what they measure, um, and then what we call trusting the DJ, so looking to my last point, how do we navigate through this? Um, in terms of bundling music, you know, what we're saying there really is that music, and there are initiatives in place that are starting this trend and this transition, but music, music needs to move in a digital world away from being a per unit sales um, and being much more of a service than a product in the way that we market it to consumers. Um, that means things like preloading onto devices, um, bundling with mobile tariffs, Offering as part of different ISP cable and things packages. You know, examples of that would be things like Nokia's comes with music, which has already been licensed by two major labels. Um, Omniphone's music station, which on the certainly on certain high, high spending tariffs is bundled with field street and consumer. Um, there's TDC in Denmark, who recently announced their initiative on, on mobile. Um, and also things like Virgin Media, where there is a, a music video download service, which on the lower tariffs comes in at a price very competitively, about 25p, but on the higher level tariff, the XL tariff, comes bundled, so it's bundled and it feels free to consumers. Experimenting with schedules and formats. Um, the old model, the way we released albums and singles on a, on a, on a schedule, seems to be running its course. It doesn't seem to be relevant in the digital world. Um, labels and artists need to experiment with different formats, uh, different ways of pricing, um, looking at those release schedules. Um, some of the other examples we've got there, like limited editions, promotional partnerships with brands. You know, we've seen initiatives like Move On Mar and Bacardi tying up. Um, we saw, I think last month, the Def Jam, Procter & Gamble um, type records announcement where a brand like Procter & Gamble is going to support new artists um, in the hip-hop environment but give them development funds that are, are you know, by Def Jam's own admission, are way, way in excess of the, the, the normal kind of AR investment um, model. Um, embracing free, so how do we change this sort of pricing issue? So stage one we talked about, which is let's understand that digital is not seen as being as valuable 
consumers as physical products. So let's at least change the price of the other car and, and, and start to respond to, to that very important view. And that's been consistent across a lot of research that we've done. Um, the culture of the net is free. We're not saying give it all away, we're saying make it feel free. We've talked about how you can bundle it with different packages, which are your broadband subscription, which your mobile tariff, and make it free and encourage behaviour that way, but in a way that generates revenue back to labels and artists. Um, and we know that you know, we've talked about money being made from other sources, um, ad supported services, brand tie ups. We know that live is flourishing, we know that people are consuming more music in various different ways than ever before. Um, things like exclusive access, VIP access, use artists' websites to develop those kind of you know, very, very close relationships with fans. You know, when we're talking about some of the, the sort of big consumer brands out there, they'll look at all the consumer acquisition costs. You know, that's creating buzz for brands. There's a lot of things around that, that we can use to excite and create extra engagement with our music as a, as a service. Changing the charts, well, we know that sales are down, and so therefore charts automatically become less relevant in that context. Um, we need to think about the ways that, that people are consuming music, whether that be via YouTube, MySpace, whether it be by, by, by blog aggregators. Um, it may even be measuring file sharing, which I think are different ways of measuring that consumption attendance of the, the high performances. Let's just think about it. Let's think about the, the how we measure it. BBC have their buzz chart, Music Ally has its own buzz tracker. These sort of things are starting to become very, very relevant as ways of charting effectively. And then finally, <coughs> just the DJ. Um, let's help consumers navigate their way through this huge long tail of music that we put out there, these millions of tracks that we're offering to them. So, I think we all know you, you, you engage with your iPod, you'll stick. 10,000 tracks on it, how many of those 10,000 tracks do you actually know, experiment with, listen to on a regular basis? You need to help consumers navigate and find a way through that potential mindset of, of, of content. Um, and that could be branded DJ services, or it could actually be using the power of networks and using the power of peer recommendations um, to, to make that happen. It could be YouTube, it could be MySpace, it could be HMVs, GetCloser.com, Beta, which is out there at the moment, that's their approach to social networking. But let's help consumers find a way through this. Let's not just say there are five million tracks out there. Let's say these are the tracks you need to be listening to this week, this month. So thanks very much. As I said earlier, um, we are about to start the group of speech across 2008. Um, so do feel free to get in touch with us. We'd love to talk to you about it or any of our broader research. Um, thanks for your attention.